Good morning. Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about restoration and resiliency in the Colorado River Delta. And as you have heard, well, the Colorado River is in trouble. It's one of the most iconic rivers in the world, but it's also one of the most regulated rivers. And well, just to simply state that, it's over allocated 60%. So there is 16% more water rights allocated than water in the river. And this river also serves 30 million people all over the west of the United States, but also in northwestern Mexico. And Mexico receives about 10% of the flow of the river every year. And the challenge is that there is not enough water anymore for the river to reach the sea, the Gulf of California and Mexico. And so what uh, the delta looked like um, 100 years ago? Well, it used to be a million acres of, of riparian vegetation, marshes, mudflats, lagoons, uh, extending all over the Mexicali Valley and also the Imperial Valley. And the river influence extended 50 miles into the sea and created this extensive estuary of 1.2 million acres, very important for marine life in the Gulf of California. Uh, but of course, things have changed with dams and water diversions and also with agricultural expansion. So we have lost about 80% of the wetland area in the Delta. This is what we see now usually in, in the Delta in Mexico, a dry riverbed. And the hydrological changes have promoted the invasion of exotic species like salt cedar here that has less uh, value for, for wildlife. And well, more importantly, as I have mentioned, well, the river is now reaching the estuary and the sea, and this is well, just exactly that, the dry riverbed not making it to the sea. And this has have a huge impact on uh, marine fish uh, that usually come to spawn and to breed and to grow in this estuary area, and one of the species is the corvina. And also the totoaba, and these are uh, endemic marine fish of the Gulf of California that have declined, and they really need the, the flows. And this has also impacted fishing communities in the Gulf of California with less freshwater flows, that are, uh, there is less shrimp, and of course this affects the livelihood of fishermen. Well, and this is what we have right now in the Delta. Uh, the yellow area is the Mexicali Valley agriculture, uh, but there is still a riparian corridor, the floodplain of the Colorado River. Uh, but we also have other areas like the Hardy River on the western side that receives agricultural return flow. And one of the most important wetlands uh, in the Sonoran Desert and of course in the Delta, the Cienega de Santa Clara is a wonderful marsh and I will mention it a little bit later. And the Delta has been recognized for its importance for wildlife, especially for birds. We still have a 380 bird species, uh, a lot of them of great importance. And every winter we have 300,000 migratory water birds, especially shorebirds, but also ducks and geese coming to this, to this area. And one of the important species is the Yuma clapper rail. It's a marsh bird. It's endemic to the lower Colorado and Delta. Uh, it's protected in the United States and also in Mexico uh, by federal laws. And 75% of the total population of Yuma clapperers in the world are in the Cienega and Santa Clara in the Delta. So with this information, we have started this restoration in endeavor for the Delta. And these are the key elements, no? On one hand, research, planning, and identification of needs for the environment, but also uh, public policy and outreach, and then the implementation of tools. And they all go hand by hand. We need to do them together. And now, uh, getting into the water issue. Now, how can we send more water to the delta for, for nature if the river is over allocated? So we know that we need new strategies and tools. We cannot just simply request water to be sent. So what we have been doing is to find voluntary market-based strategies. What this means is basically acquisition of water rights from willing sellers in the Mexicali Valley. For this purpose, we establish a water trust. So we have been purchasing water rights in a, in a very dynamic open market that exists in the Mexicali Valley. Usually water is buy and sell by, by farmers and cities who we just inserted ourselves in that market and are purchasing water rights and putting them in the river. And so we're trying to get any water that we can, no, not just only water rights, but also, uh, as I mentioned, um, agricultural returns flow, but in this case, treated wastewater. And there is a wastewater plant called Las Arenitas that treats water from the city of Mexicali. And we uh, made an agreement with the state government of Baja California 
to have 30% of the flow guaranteed as an in-stream flow for the Hardy River. So this has been very important because it duplicates the flow in the Hardy, and it, uh, with this we have reached our, our goal in terms of uh, how much water we want in the Hardy River. And in addition to that, we were able to, to convince the, the state government to construct this artificial wetland. So this is a before and after picture. You can see here, this is the plant, and it was just bare land that was degraded. This used to be wetlands 100 years ago, but it was dry then. And so in this partnership, we were able to construct this 250-acre wetland um, to improve water quality before it gets into the river, but also as, a, as habitat. And it has been working very, very nicely. Um, we have already 150 bird species, uh, 15,000 uh, birds going to the site regularly. And I want to talk a little bit more about the Cienega Santa Clara. It's on the eastern side of the delta, and it's about 40,000 acres um, of marshland on the northern part, but also mudflats in the southern part. And it's very close to the mouth of the river. Um, and so this is a wetland that is truly binational because, well, it's in Mexico, right here. About 90% of the water from the Cienega comes from, from the United States through the main outlet drainage extension canal. The challenge here is that this same water has been targeted to be used by the Yuma salting plant, and so if, if it's used completely by the plant, then the wetland will disappear. So I will show some pictures just to, so you can see how the wetland evolved um, as water was reaching the area from the 70s to the 80s. And the red color is green cattle vegetation. So this is satellite images. And so you can see how it has been growing, and it's in great shape now. Um, so one of the interesting things about the binational negotiation is that it has allowed to create new opportunities and partnerships between the United States and Mexico. So with the drought, there was more interest in operating the plant. So uh, there was a, a suggestion or a, a proposal put forward by Arizona, Nevada, California, and the Bureau of Reclamation to operate the Yuma Salting Plant at one-third capacity. So we, we responded that, well, it would be interesting to, to do this, and they wanted to do this really to, to see if the plant still works and to get a, a good, uh, to get said, um, to know if what was the real cost of the water by operating the plant. So um, we responded that it was a good idea, but we needed to do it in a way that didn't harm the Cienega. So there was this historic agreement between Mexico, the US, and environmental groups to do the test, but uh, also to protect the Cienega. And so we found replacement water to send the Cienega during the trial run. And so it was the first time in which both countries dedicate water for the environment in the Delta from their own allocation. And it's the first time that environmental groups are part of the treaty. And also there was a comprehensive binational monitoring program to see how the process work. And during this time, and when the replacement water was coming, there was also a big fire in the Cienega. And like the prairie, these disturbance uh, events, natural disturbance events, are good, are good, are part of the natural system, especially if they are natural. And now I want to show a picture of just the Cienega before the fire. You can see it here. And then just after the fire, 80% of the Cienega was burned during this event. But just three weeks later, it, was, it came out really good, really fast, and rejuvenated. No? So it, the, the message here is that if the hydrology is there, then the resiliency is there, and, and, and the system works really nice. And we have been tracking wildlife populations. Again, the Yuma Clapper Rail is a great indicator. And through this process, their populations are in very good shape. There are about 8,000 Clapper Rails in the Cienega. So these are our, our main lessons from the Delta. We know that we have a regulatory framework, public policies, and the support from different stakeholders for restoration. Uh, we know that binational cooperation is essential and it's feasible. We know that water allocation is feasible through different mechanisms. And the protection of large areas through reserves and conservation easements is also feasible. And more important, we know that we have a very resilient ecosystem and that restoring the Colorado River Delta and reconnecting the river with the sea is something that we can achieve within the next five to 10 years. Thank you very much.